Thank you both so much for joining me today. To start out with uh, Senator Nelson, what's the purpose of the Behavioral Health Council? Well, I think the state has recognized after many years that we need a more coherent response to mental health and substance abuse issues. And so the judiciary, the executive branch, and the legislature have got together and put together this council to really spend a year with the experts developing a strategic plan to how we go forward with mental health and substance abuse issues. And what prompted the formation of this committee, Representative Likely? Well, I think it's been probably about a decade watching Idaho suicide numbers grow and the conversations around mental health. And uh, it was it was noticed, um, you know, a good number of years ago, and it took until last year um, in the 2020 legislative session, the Senate concurrent resolution, to kind of recognize that we needed to do something. And that kind of set forward the executive um, order that uh, the good governor put in place and, and where we are today. Uh, suicide numbers in Idaho have grown pretty significantly over the last decade. In fact, um, in 2019, Idaho was number five in the nation for the number of suicides. Uh, we did drop down to number 11 last year, but that still does not um, delineate or deny the fact that we have a serious mental health and a substance abuse problem in the state of Idaho. And I think that um, recognizing uh, that it was up to all of us to step up and, and you know, develop a, a strategic plan moving forward. So it's been, you know, it's been a decade in the making and I, I'm happy to see it coming to fruition about now. Before we get into some of the specifics about what you're discussing and, and what some of the rec recommendations might be, what's the timeline? When can we start expecting some actual you know, reports or policy recommendations from the council? You can actually go to the um, Department of Health and Welfare's Idaho Behavioral Health Council website right now and look at all of the meeting minutes, look at the working group reports, looking at the advisory committee. All of those reports are available online for the public view right now. And uh, from an overall strategic position, the Idaho Behavioral Health Council will have a recommendation to Governor Little by the end of June. We're starting to uh, put all of the pieces, we're kind of, you know, defining a plan and then we're you know assessing the system what is out there putting all the pieces of the behavioral mental health and substance abuse issues on the table um, we're going to find out where we're where we're short are we short in uh, providers are we short in um, critical access for our youth and then we will you know recommend those actions uh, moving forward at the uh, again at the end of june and, and right now is an important time in our process because we're just about to enter a public comment period. Mm -hmm. We've got the major pieces together. We're trying to, uh, from the uh, advisory boards, we're trying to refine them and decide really what we should recommend. And so start starting, uh, I believe it's April 1st, the public, public comment period is there. And we'd really like to hear that comment now, and we have another three or four meetings of the council itself to settle on what we will do. Additionally, uh, next uh, Tuesday night from 5 to 7 p.m., you can tune in to the public comments that uh, we requested those. Those are in the uh, pipeline right now, and we will have a live Zoom presentation next Thursday or next Tuesday night from 5 to 7. So if you head on over to the Behavioral Health Council's website, you can kind of take a look and, and hear um, some of the additional public comments. We did take public comment last fall from the from consumer from providers, from other mental health um, and substance abuse um, uh, providers and caretakers in the system, families. And, you know, I've had the opportunity over the last uh, couple of days since we've been on recess to wade through some of those comments. And, and it's really fascinating to find um, what is common between each subgroup and then what is, what is different and what will be needed to make certain that we're addressing needs of each of those groups. And, and we'll be sure to, to, oh, sorry, Senator, we'll be sure to post the link okay. to that Zoom call, that 5 p.m. Mountain Time, 4 p.m. Pacific call on the Idaho Reports social media. It, as we get into specific problems, um, I, I know that Idaho is such a diverse state. I've reported on healthcare issues regionally and statewide. I, I'm wondering, 
How do these issues that you're hearing about from stakeholders vary region to region, Senator? Um, you know, I think we have many of the same problems, but how we can attack them are differently. Uh, for example, in my area that's pretty rural up in Leitai, Benawa County, Central Idaho, uh, we've established recovery centers or crisis centers, excuse me, that are very small and uh, nimble. They're not always staffed, but they have somebody there. We're in a bigger area like the Treasure Valley or Kootenai County have full-time, full-staffed uh, crisis centers. And those crisis centers have been an important step in helping with our mental health needs in, in order to reduce, uh, you know, keep people out of entering the mental health system via the criminal justice system, which has been a big problem in our state. So that's just one example. I think another might be uh, staffing issues. We have a real problem in, in rural Idaho in finding professionals to come into our areas and provide treatment, especially with our, our, our reimbursement rates, which tend to be quite slow or quite low. Uh, whereas that's not quite the issue in, uh, in Boise, but here it's a big issue. I mean, we've had a crisis center essentially funded and ready to open in Idaho County for the last year and a half, I think, and we can't find the staffing to be able to, to, to bring that up. I might add that, you know, it, it does vary. It, it varies from the urban to the rural, rural areas very greatly. And I think uh, Senator Nelson touched on the fact that, you know, providers is, is a huge component thereof. We do. We've got crisis centers in seven different locations across the state of Idaho. Those are traditionally only, only dealing with adult adult crisis needs. And again, they're very short term. We're not looking at a longer term recovery plan. And I think that with the strategic plan from the Behavioral Health Council, we'll maybe address, you know, using peer reviewed and peer counseling and recovery and consistency and a mentoring need down the road. But on the front end, we really have got to kind of look at uh, crisis centers for our young students, our, uh, you know, our middle school and high school students. We don't have have an option for them if they're suffering um, from a mental health illness at this point. Their first um, choice, parents' first choice, is often the emergency room. And we really have got to develop a system, you know, from, from zero to when they're, when they're adults. And I think that this uh, strategic plan will start to address some of those needs. Consistently, we hear, you know, transportation to care is, is huge. Housing is needed. You know, what, what other emergency options do we have? Mentors for long-term support. So again, I do think our rural communities, often it's, talking about mental health is, is got a stigma attached to it. And even those folks in my rural and my ag communities have a difficult time talking about it. And I think we've got to be able to, to talk about bullying. I think we have to be able to talk about intimidation. And I think we have got to be able to talk about, you know, being able to recognize that, that mental illness is just that. It is an illness. And there's a, a good cross section of folks out there that are willing to tackle this head on and come forward with solutions that work for you and your communities. And you know, you both bring up, oh, sorry, Senator, go ahead. Well, I just want to say reducing that stigma is so important. And so uh, I think a, a big piece of our plan will be on promotion and education. So people recognize, can reduce that stigma people will know that it's they need to go get help and they they know how to enter the system right now it's fairly opaque on how you would go get mental health health issues and really our goal is to ha have a system that people can get the help they need when they need it and not not end up in jail and then and then go into it or in the emergency room and trying to decide uh, let's just make a, a more a system that's more useful for everyone when they need it you know, you, you both bring up so many complex topics that are all interconnected and at covering the legislature for 10 sessions now i've i've seen lawmakers try to tackle complex issues multiple times whether it's reading scores in third grade or transportation funding and it often takes a long time does the legislature have the ability right now to address such a complex issue representative likely 
Yes, and I think that um, I challenge all of my colleagues um, to, to step up and, and recognize our commitment to uh, mental health and behavioral health and substance abuse in the state of Idaho. Uh, you may be aware that House Concurrent Resolution passed out of the House, um, out of health and welfare, and um, as well as uh, you know, off of the House floor and went over to, uh, to the Senate, um, which really kind of commits Idaho to recognizing crisis management. Obviously it's tied to the 988 hotline, but I would, I would challenge us all to step back and recognize how critical it is to collaborate, find those experts in those areas and come forward with solutions that work. And sometimes having those difficult conversations need to happen and they need to happen now. And we've got to be very sensitive. We've got to be able to show some empathy and we've got to bring bring people to the table to have those conversations. And and I hope that, you know, again, I, I'm only one of 70 votes on that house floor, but I'm really committed to coming forward with the solution, um, not only in, in the area of suicide, but crisis management and, you know, taking care of our early childhood development and making programs available for our folks with traumatic brain injuries, senior citizens, veterans, and so forth. I'm, I'm at the table long term and I, I'm excited to, to work with good folks like Senator Nelson and others in the Senate, as well as the, the good gentleman on the second floor, our governor. I think we're all committed to finding a long-term solution to reduce those suicide numbers and, and detach the stigma uh, of mental health in the state of Idaho. You know, there's the question of, of, of tackling this from a policy perspective, but then there's the question of making necessary investments in healthcare, in mentorship programs, in education. Senator, do you feel like the legislature has the appetite to make those investments? Uh, I, I hope so. Uh, I think maybe I'm a little skeptical rep than representative likely, but I hope we are. Uh, you know, some of them we, we, we are finding some low hanging fruit in different places. For example, Medicaid expansion is letting us uh, pay for medical services in our in-state hospitals using Medicaid dollars. So that stretches our money a bit. I think there's a fair bit of recognition that the, if the entry point to mental health is the criminal justice system, that's about the most expensive entry point we can make. So finding efficiencies when we redesign the system so it's not that has, has benefit. I do worry on things like our recovery centers, which we have around the, the, the state that we've had for uh, a few years, that we continue to, to, to provide them one-time money e each year and ask them to fundraise for roughly half, half of their, their stuff. You know, we can't just treat people and then expect them to be better with especially substance abuse issues. That's a long-term thing. They need to be in recovery. And I think we need to be sure we recognize those costs are paid for in a sustainable model. I think this year-to-year -year approach uh, is something I would worry about in the long term. We're, we're talking about money on one hand, but then there are also policy questions. And are there any examples of, I don't want to say low hanging fruit, but easier tweaks than others that Idaho has been making or could be making now to meet this goal of reducing this, this crisis care and addressing it on the front end? People like to use, you know, what has happened over the last year with coronaviruses as a, a, a case for, you know, higher suicide numbers. Well, I'm going to challenge those that we had this crisis prior to coronavirus. And so the fact that, you know, as the lawmaking body, we have to work with our partners across across multiple aisles to develop policy that works. And sometimes it's uncomfortable. And, and I think that sometimes we forget that we have to to be able to look a little more deeply with, you know, whether it be the public health districts, the Department of Health and Welfare, Child Protective Services, um, the Idaho, you know, our Idaho uh, teaching, our educational systems, and and find policies that that really support 
crisis management and and acceptance thereof. And you know, I don't like people who just decide they want to use the fact that you know coronavirus. They you know they they speculate that suicide numbers have gone up dramatically. Well, that's simply not the case. Have we had more calls to our crisis hotlines? Yes, but our suicide numbers are roughly on par with where they were in 2018, which was a record high year for the state of Idaho. So this is a long term problem when we've got long term solutions. And I really think that we need to buckle down and um, as a state and as communities and families and come forward with policies that work. I'm happy to do the heavy lifting. I'm happy to carry those policies that have long term implications to the to the health you know, of our workforce and our families and and our communities. And, and it's not going to be easy. Um, but again, I think as Senator Nelson mentioned, if we can look at what we're spending on corrections and we can invest on the front end with early childhood development programs, supporting our parents, supporting our families and supporting our school systems and communication between each of us, we're gonna be a lot better off in the long run. And I'm, I'm fully committed to making sure that, that the policies that come forward, you know, move us forward and, and not backward. Yeah, Senator, I wanted to get your thoughts on that too. Are there any easy policy tweaks that we could be looking at? Uh, you know, I think the crisis centers were the were the obvious low hanging fruit that we've captured already, and and I think uh, uh, perhaps some uh, perhaps uh, 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 broadening that methodology to more places, as we've learned in central Idaho, how, how to do those in, in smaller areas is is it, it would be one. But I don't know that there are easy tweaks below that. I mean, I I know getting the system realigned so people can access it easily when they need it is, is important. And that's not going to be cheap or easy. Having providers available in the communities uh, is, is again, that's we need to be have a system that can pay for those providers. Uh, so I, 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 I don't know that there are other easy things. We need to go out and do the heavy lifting, as, as uh, Representative Likely says. One last question, and I'll start with you, Senator. This, as as you just said, is a ship that is going to take a while to turn. So when we look back in 15 years, what are the metrics of success going to be? How do we know that what you're doing now has worked? Well, I, th I think emergency admits to the mental health system would be one. Um, I think op opioid deaths, have, have we reduced that? Uh, P numbers of people in recovery, in recovery centers or AA or, or however we might be doing that at that time. Um, I think a healthier economy. I, I look at places in my district like St. Mary's and Plummer, which have a fairly significant drug problems. And if their crime rates are measurably go down and their unemployment rates go down with them because there are jobs in those communities, I think that would be a great measure of success. And Representative, I wanted to get your thoughts too. Well, I think that uh, Senator Nelson hit on a lot of those. I think that you know, if if our if in addition to what he commented on, I think that you know. Do they have adequate housing? Do they have transportation for their needs? Are we communicating? I think these are all measurables. Are they communicating between crisis points? Is the uh, middle, middle school counselor communicating with that child's counselor outside? Are we keeping that child out of the, um, the corrections system? And so the fact that the Behavioral Health Council is addressing each um, branch of government, we're communicating, we're going to have a plan between, I think the communication within, those are going to be measurables, Melissa, not only short term, but we're going to be able to measure those um, long term. And then I think we're going to find out what's working and then be able to tweak those along the way. That's why these long term plans are so important. And this is something, again, that we've got to get our hands around now. And I think we're on the, on the right path. All right, Senator Nelson, Representative Likely, thank you both so much for joining us today. Thanks thank for the you. opportunity.